Welcome to another flight night. I'm Red McCombs. Hey, hey, Red. How you doing there, Farrell? It's good. I'm doing good tonight. This, we got a great show, a rematch between blue and green. Yes, yes. It is the blue Magoo versus the green mm. machine. This is a tremendous moment for Dragon Kai. This rematch right here. It's When you think about green and blue, you think mm -hmm. of classic dragon. And, and you being they, purple, it's perfect color commentary. It's the perfect color commentary. Thank you. Let's go down to the corners here for pre-fight uh, oh. instructions from each corner. You've been training hard. You lost the first one, but you got this shit. Listen, this money, this purse money, it's yours. All you got to do is win this thing. Don't lose like you lost last time, you son of a bitch. Listen, I've trained my whole life for this. I ain't going down again. I ain't going out like that. Now I want you to look over there. Now I want you to look at me. Now look over there. That's your enemy. You get this fight and you got this money. I didn't get a good night's sleep though. No, it's not gonna be a good fight. No, running season started yesterday. We're all over oh, here. Trust me, I know. You don't let me do anything while I'm working out. No, so. you gotta save that energy. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, my legs are fine. That's why I'm a quadruped with wings. So mm. I don't understand that. It never made sense. It to doesn't me. make a lot of sense. Sorry. You tried to tell me about those dreams you've been having last night, and don't let it get inside your head. You done wiped the floor with green once. You can do it again! We can talk about that thing you wanted to talk about later. I want that sweet, tasty dream juice. Yeah, you want that dream juice. We'll get you that dream juice. All right, give me a hug. Uh, all right, there we go. All right, I want a good, clean fight. No tail slaps, no wing buffets, and above all, no breath weapons. Watch the peasants in the first row. Let's get it on! What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? Now you give them the Forrest Whitaker eye. Mm. Oh, oh, shit. Oh, what's this feeling? Stop trying to distract me. When we locked eyes, I just, I thought I felt something oh there. Oh my God. Something I've never felt before. I can before. feel my cloaca moisten. Uh, what the hell are you doing? That's not what I pay you for. Son of a bitch. Why did we ever fight? This is so much more fun. Oh yeah. Oh my God. I don't mm. even know what green and blue make. Oh. Mm. I think we got. We're uh, talking about dragons um, today on web. DM? Yeah, we're DM. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by Hero Forge. They are the masters of customizable miniatures. You can choose from thousands of options to design your figures in full 3D, precisely to your specifications. They'll print them out in high quality plastic or metal and send them straight to your door. Or download the files and create them on your own 3D printer. Is your villain a weird gnome with robot feet and insect wings and a scaly tail? Ah, uh, you can make it right on Hero Forge. So go visit them and start designing your custom miniature because only Hero Forge understands your true artistic vision and allows you to realize it so that you can terrorize your players, send them screaming home to the night, and argue about it later online. Visit HeroForge.com to start designing your custom miniature today and check back often. New content is added every week. Link in the comment and description. All right, Jim. Let's let's return to a topic that we've uh, we've touched on a couple of times. Yeah. And revisiting this is uh, is da is a danger in and of itself. Oh, but, certainly. Uh, but these damn dragons, they're still these around damn after how many dragons. five editions, like forty something, fifty years almost, and the, and they're still half the goddamn title. And they're still there. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I, what are you gonna do? So we've got two other dragon shows and and uh, a show on red dragons, which you know is just sort of generic kind of. Uh, well, it is the classic, show. like yeah. you know, it's on all the books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the t-shirts. And the t-shirts and all that good stuff. And it's also like it's uh, in, in terms of like shows, it we cover a lot of things in it that are useful for just like any dragons, not just red. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a good show, but it needs sort of a bit of an update. And then we did another show where I think we tried to cram in every, every other dragon. <laughs> But of course, <laughs> in typical fashion, you can't cover it all. So we left out a couple. I think there were a couple but, that we ended up not getting But I think that, to. Yeah. That, that show is a good resource, though. Yes. Like, if you just need, like, a quick capsule, like, what is this dragon all about? I yeah. mean, I think you break it down pretty great yeah. as we just kind of, like, you know, fastball yeah. special that shit. Yeah. Um, but uh, in 13 minutes, you know, we only forgot what, like the void, the prismatic, uh, yeah, the, the prismatic, mist, um, uh, one of the others, uh, the other big one, force, uh, platinum, force, yeah, platinum, one, yeah. yeah, some of the like, like the planar dragons, sort of forgot about, but like the, the the ones you're more likely to encounter. You know, the more we got away from those two shows, the more I sort of realized like there's so many topics surrounding 
dragons mm -hmm. and, and how to use them and how to feature them that I was like, you know, we really need to return to dragons one day. And there's some oh, yeah. other, other of those shows that we'll probably return to as well, but like revisiting our dragon show and thinking like, all right, what can we add to this and how can we like expand on what we've already said? Right. I mean, there, I think there's a hell of a lot to talk Gosh. about with dragons because I mean, if, it, <laughs> if they're not just like a random, a roll on a random encounter, sure. right? Like you're walking along, oh, I rolled two, two wormling green dragons yeah. or whatever, but these beasts have a place in your world. Right? Sure. Like yeah. they, they have a they have a lair, they have a or a hovel or a home or whatever they have. Yeah. And they, they interact with the world, therefore there is evidence of them. So like as yeah. a long time DM, how do you like to integrate tra dragons in your world? Like as far as like I mean the like how do you handle it? Thing. How do you yeah. feature them? You know, they're they're iconic, they're the they're an apex predator. There's always a dragon on an encounter list, you know, if I if I create uh, a mm -hmm. random encounter table that I intend to use mm -hmm. multiple times and not one I'm just, you know, a one off use, then there's probably a dragon on that entry somewhere because I like the idea of like running into a dragon like we don't mean to you're they're just like flying oh yeah and it doesn't have to be like the dragon swoops down on them and attacks them it might be they spot one from a distance or they t you know they find evidence of uh, you know that one was here recently maybe a temporary uh, you know bed that it had lied down in or something mm -hmm. like that um, so I like having them there and I like throwing casual references to dragons uh, you know, in my journey descriptions, in in sort of like the local folklore of a uh, of a region or something. First off, it's, they're iconic, right? They're dragons. They they are in the title of the game, uh, but it also like ties the fantasy world together and like makes the dragons a part of it, mm -hmm. as opposed to like dragons used as a a central centerpiece for a campaign where it's like, yeah, we they're a big bad. <laughs> you know, maybe we know, maybe we don't. But like because they're the big bad, they they're treated maybe a little differently. Like the, they get brought out whenever the DM needs them to. Yeah. They don't live in the campaign world. You can't like just run into them, yeah. uh, you know, like you can other NPCs if you're playing that style. And so that's sort of where I start from. I like an idea of, of dragons as being integrated into the world and a part of it. And so what I'll usually do is look at my map. That's the first thing I'll do when I'm trying to feature a dragon in my world. You know, what spots on this map look like they would make for good layers using the information provided in the monster manual which will tell you, you know, okay, you know, are they social, you know, dragons? Are they more reclusive? Where do they like to make their layers? From there, making note that in the DMG, it it's basically says, you know, for a, you know, like for every 50 square miles, there might be six large predators uh, and no more than one uh, dragon. It's just like tucked away in the DMG somewhere. And so I, I try to just kind of keep that in mind. So as I'm looking at my regional maps and saying like, okay, this mountain range right here, Looks like it'd be good for a red dragon. Here's a manticore, and here's like a wyvern nest, and then I'm gonna also put maybe some aquatic type monsters on there that hunt the riverways or something like. I start looking at where those areas might overlap mm -hmm. or intersect, and while the DMG doesn't recommend more than one dragon per 50 square kilometer map, like, I kind of think you should. <laughs> you know, like, two creates a situation where the dragons could have territorial disputes. Oh, yeah. Um, it, it, it's a equilibrium situation that the PCs can disrupt and therefore, you know, spur adventures. Yeah, play one against the other. You know? Play one against the other, yeah. And, and especially if you have, like, two that are they're sort of opposite or opposing or something yeah, like yeah. that, yeah. It's mostly a matter of, at this stage, looking at the big picture. What does my region look like? What is the terrain of it and the geography mm -hmm. of it? of it and the climate of it suggest about the large predators there. Where are the major population centers that the dragon might either avoid or try to extract and, and you know, get some kind of tribute from? Uh, are there any roads or anything that, that pass by where the dragon lairs that might be susceptible to attack uh, or something like that? I mean, we're, while we're on the subject of it, it's worth just sort of noting at this stage how far dragons can travel and, you know, what their range is and yeah. marking it on the map. <laughs> you yeah, know? I mean, we, we did a little map beforehand yeah. and... You know, dragons got some range. Dragons have some range, right? There's some wonkiness and weirdness with the way that the combat movements uh, work out to, uh, you know, like travel rates. But I think when you consider, like, these are creatures that are large and cumbersome and they're probably flying... Uh, at, at high altitudes to take advantage of sort of like air currents and updraft and everything, that they can travel pretty far a, a, in a day. And we estimated ourselves anywhere from like 80 to 90 miles. You know, flying mounts have to you uh, have to rest for one hour for every three hours of travel. That lowers that down to like 72 uh, miles in a day. That's max, right? You'd have to you'd have to have it for uh, you know how far you would go out to get back to your uh, 
get back to the layer. But once you have that information, let's just call it uh, right now, say something like 48, right? Mm -hmm. You can begin to see where the dragon hunts, where the dragon mm -hmm. might uh, find ref seek, uh, like um, backup refuge. Oh yeah. Right? You, you oh yeah. Oh, start to see places it's familiar with. Who dwells there? What other creatures are mm -hmm. there? And now you start to get a better picture of the region that you've got, the dragon that inhabits it, and uh, you're making note of lair effects, which on map scale cover one hex in a kingdom scale map. That's the six miles of hex. Or like a six hex radius in a provincial scale map, which is a one hex per one mile. That's where you just make note. Okay, what does is, what is the lair of my green dragon do? How does this impact it? You know, do the locals think anything about it is the, you know are there any legends are there any mm -hmm. you know uh, folk wisdom yeah. about this thing start thinking about it that way yeah um, when you go by the swamp just leave a small tribute right and the rest of your travels yeah will be un un will be un un you'll be unhindered yeah uh, and this is a very naturalistic way of thinking about it this is more of a dragons as large beasts large predators style of thinking about it i can feel myself uh turning away from the majestic Flipping huge magic using super intelligent uh, monster, yeah, yeah. you know that that kind of like the smog type dragon, where it's just like they're big, they're ancient, they know everything, they're powerful, and I find like in terms of like evocative imagery, that's a f fun dragon. In terms of delivering a satisfying game experience, that's an intimidating beast that a lot of players are not going to want to encounter and tangle with till they're much higher level. I'm all about fighting dragons as soon as we can. Oh, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, I, I, fifth level is, is when I want to start fighting dragons. It's in the name of the game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and in that respect, I have tended towards, and, and very recently, towards smaller dragons. Dragons that are not these gigantic, lumbering, you know, flying lizards, but are, you know, maybe the size of a large horse. Mm -hmm. uh, or an elephant or something like that. And they're still big, they're still dangerous, they still fly and have breath weapons. They might even talk and be intelligent, but they're a bit smaller in scope, make them a bit, uh, I don't know, a bit easier to handle, you know? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've never really had a problem with, with talking dragons, because I, yeah. think, I think that's, it's fun. Yes. But yeah, they don't have to be the 20th level caster Oh, sure. you know, 24 <laughs> intelligence, like they've seen everything yeah. because that starts to get old a little bit. It, yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's like even in the original D&D, &D, uh, they're not the most powerful creatures in the Monster Manual. Those things are reserved for stuff like purple worms and giants and demons and, and things like that, vampires and the like. Hydra, I think, yeah. is more powerful. Uh, and in certain versions of original D&D &D is infinitely powerful because it has as many heads as you want it to have. Wow, I mean, <laughs> cut off one and two replaces it. So. Right. <laughs> and so uh, the dragons sort of occupy the space where they're, they're iconic, but they're not necessarily the best. Mm -hmm. And I like that approach to it, where dragons are, you don't want to mess with them. And you certainly don't want to, like approach them frivolously uh, if you're going to hunt them, mm -hmm. but they're not these things that DMs feel like they've got to reserve for the epic moments of their campaign. They're not these monsters where when players hear about them in the world, they start getting, oh, like maybe you want that kind of nervousness and that, that sort of trepidation from them, but at the end of the day, I usually think of like, I would rather my players not be nervous about anything in the game mm -hmm. so that they feel free to engage with it as opposed to they feel nervous because their characters feel nervous and that's a satisfying, immersive experience, but can lead to a lot of like, well, no, we don't want to go do that. That sounds dangerous <laughs> kind of right, thinking. Right. Uh, and that's not fun. Well, you know, that's not why we play. I think that a lot of that can be uh, also how you pull the pull the curtain back and reveal yeah. the fact that yes. there's a dragon in that that is their foe right, right. like yeah. so how do you like to uh, make a more organic and immersive uh, game mm -hmm. uh, by 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 disseminating those clues how do you like to do that so you know this is the uh, you know following the maximum of DMs uh, to show not tell you know it'd be mm -hmm. easy enough to say all right guys you know this is the map you know that icon right there that's a dragon lair and instead have it be part of say uh, Rumor tables. Mm -hmm. Rumor tables are one of those uh, things that that have fallen out of favor in terms of just like the play experience of D and D, and but they're like a staple of sandbox play. And the kind of dragon that we're describing now is a dragon that you would include in a sandbox, right? Like you're not creating uh, set piece battles out of it. It's not a centerpiece villain that, that shows up when you need them to. They're a thing in the world, and so they should have. Um, 
references to them. Pl maybe place names uh, are named after them. Maybe uh, there's uh, sort of like, like we mentioned earlier, local legends or rhymes or myths or something mm -hmm. about it. You know, we uh, you know, offer the dragon something when you're on this stretch of the road and it won't bother you or, you know, but don't go out at night, period. Um, yeah. Those sorts of things are how I would begin to uh, disseminate that. So why is this part of the trail called Tyrell's scorn. Sure, it's like, yeah, yeah. Well, don't piss off Tyrell. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just don't do it. <laughs> and uh, there's him. The, you'll find you'll out. You'll find out. <laughs> and um, it, you know, it, make it a personality in the world. What if you know, if it's truly fantastical, then then and the dragon like makes itself known and collects tribute from the places that are around. Then go a step further, and the dragon's the local lord, <laughs> you know, but maybe it's not spoken. Maybe it's referred to as the terror or the fear or, um, you know, the beast. Maybe it's given a euphemistic name uh, or something like that. Don't let the night take you. Uh, that's how I do it in, in Lamb Between Two Rivers. The dragons have these names like, you know, Sleeping Death and, and mm -hmm. Fear. And, you know, for, for fear, it's specifically, it's like, don't let fear get you. And it's a common enough phrase that you say to people as they're about to head out into the wilderness and the wasteland, like, don't let fear get you. But it's also a reminder, there's something out there that we call fear, and it gets people, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. And oh, it's I, that I, kind I, of thing. Yeah, I love playing with concepts like that that yeah. players can easily misinterpret. Like, they can like easily saying, misinterpret. I'm imagining a black dragon named the Knight. It's like, yeah. yeah, the Knight will come for you. The Knight will come for you. go out at night, yeah. the Knight will come for you. Yeah, especially if you're playing uh, PCs who are not from, not from around these parts. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Which, you know, a lot of PCs aren't. What are you, a bunch of city boys? <laughs> no, <sorry. laughs> and so, like, rumors uh, uh -huh. can be delivered by, you know, the things you overhear in the marketplace. You know, your characters are buying something from a market stall, and the next stall over, they're talking about, you know, uh, their flocks have uh, thinned out because something's hunting them mm -hmm. or something like that. Maybe it's, like, veterans uh, or, like, ex-dragon slayers, and they're just, you know, well, who that guy over there in the corner is missing a hand, and, you know, they're sitting with, they're all missing parts of them, actually. Yeah, there's and, a lot of burns in this village. A lot of burns, <laughs> a lot of scarred up, and you know, they just have a grim, dead-eyed look, and you know, maybe it takes some uh, winning over of yeah. those uh, gruff uh, veterans, but you, they eventually will share their tales of fighting dragons. Or I'm just imagining like Dragon Slayers coming to a town and seeing that the fields are fertile and full, but you get into town and everybody's a little bit too thin. Yeah. And it's just kind of like, but there's plenty of, there's plenty your of flocks are full, yeah. and, you know, and it's, everybody's just like, oh, yeah, no, you know. no, no, <laughs> no. The Lord takes his due. It's like there's no fences anywhere, right? Like, it's just, yeah. like, why, like, really? These sheep all stay here, you know, yeah, no, yeah. Even the ones that escape, <laughs> they come back by morning, you know, <laughs> until they don't. Until they don't. <laughs> uh, so that's what, one way of doing it. And, and rumors, I think, they, they get a bad rap. Rumor tables especially get a bad rap because it sort of falls in that cliche of meeting in the tavern and getting a rumor and a wizard hires you. But if you change the vector of the rumor to be like snippets of conversation overheard. Yeah. Uh, someone asking you at the, maybe it's the guard at the city gate going like, oh, you came up from the south? Um, you know, did you watch the skies any? Did you see anything unusual? Maybe there's someone that they meet in the city uh, mm -hmm. asks that. Or as they're departing, like, well, I'm praying for clear skies for you. Why? Yeah. Yeah, we don't well, talk about yeah, it. Yeah, we don't talk about <laughs> they it. Don't we don't talk about it, right? It can hear us when we talk about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, that's sort of one way to do it. You can uh, you can have like dragon scholars, draconic scholars, and the like, people that are experts on draconic lore. They might be quest givers. They might be people who are like, you know, oh, the, yeah, I, I came here specifically to study this region's dragons, and you know, there used to be a lot of them, and now there's not anymore. I don't know why. And now the quest is like figure out what happened to the dragons that used to be a part of here. Is it like a rival that's shown up? And pushed all the others out or, yeah, or something you know yeah, that's what i'm thinking immediately you know, yeah a big yeah. a big one came in and well yeah and now you <laughs> now you've got a uh, a meg <laughs> meg situation right here it's a megalodon <laughs> yeah that's where i would start that's the showing part you're, you're not going to just tell them you're going to demonstrate that this dragon exists in the world that the npcs react to it in a, in a plausible manner that there are artifacts and mm -hmm. and material objects that are either relate to the dragon or a part of it yeah and like you're in embedding it in the world and bonus points if you start connecting PC motivations and backgrounds and the like to that dragon, give them a reason to go after it. Okay, I, and, I, and I love that because it, it kind of takes us into the next part uh, rather organically in that, so say you've seeded these clues and yeah. they, the players are picking up on it and they start to realize like, oh shit, I think there's a dragon around here. Yeah. So 
if the player's like, well, let's find it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. How do you handle that next part? Like, you know, I mean, maybe it's not the whole campaign. Sure. That's like what the, kind of the way we're, we're discussing this. But yeah. yeah, they want to go after a dragon, maybe. Yeah, it could easily fill up two or three sessions. Let yourself be derailed <laughs> and, and have like a side thing where they, they have to track it down. So to me, it starts with that gathering of information, like yeah. how they find the dragon, where it is. You know, do the locals know where its lair is? It's possible mm-hmm. that it, the locals know one or two places you can go to to meet a dragon. Yeah. And if we're dealing with like the big majestic sort of intelligent dragons, they might have a place set aside specifically for meeting with mortals. Yeah, you know, like a tribute or yeah, something problems or whatever. Yeah, something like that. They're not going to take you back to their lair. That's crazy. First of all, you wouldn't really be able to get there without it carrying you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're yeah, not going to do that. It's not going to let you <laughs> not do that. No. <laughs> but this field, these stones, you know, you bring a goat, uh, you, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Just imagine Jurassic Park. <laughs> right. Wait in the wagon until Wait it in eats the, wagon, the goat. <laughs> uh, or something else, you know. That's one way to do it. And maybe you like meet with the dragon that way and sort of get a measure of it. Talk to it. Uh, and the like. Yeah, you shouldn't fight a dragon until you look it in the eye first. Yeah, look it in the eye first. Get, first off, get used to its fear. You know, like stand in its presence and uh, get used. You know, get used to being there. But other things you can do is like look for local legends or lore. Maybe there are legends about the lair itself, or legends about the horde that it keeps in there. It doesn't have to be about the dragon. Not all the information has to be about this big reptile. It can be about the things that it's done. Which, you know, splitting hairs. But it could also be about the lair or the horde or famous dragon slayers who have attempted to slay it and been unsuccessful. Those are other ways that you can kind of obliquely give information about a monster. Of course, all of this works for pretty much any big monster. You can obliquely give it to the party and let them draw their own conclusions. And who knows what might come out of that? Maybe something that's like way more engaging than something you thought up because, you know, they're coming looking at it with fresh eyes. Well, yeah, I mean, we've talked about this before, and, and sometimes it can be the exact opposite, and sure. that, that sidetrack can actually derail your campaign. It can, yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're, the, if you're the kind of DM and, and group that like has campaigns which, whether you're laying the rails as a group and, and creating the railroad as you go, because you're doing exactly what it is that you want to do, or you're in a railroad you know, a game in which the options are further limited and that's fine with you, then yeah, that that might derail it. But I mean, I really am a, a big fan of the, here's my game world, here's, the, here's this place I created for us to play in, and you've got some input too from, from, you know, from your player characters and other stuff, and what's interesting here? What do you like? And, and part of that style of play is for the players to have adequate information to make choices about where they want to go mm-hmm. and to be able to say no when they no longer want to engage with that content. And so it could be that this, these steps here, these gathering information, uh, this is mostly social related stuff, but you might also go out and look for, say, um, you know, start looking, combing the wilderness and mm-hmm. seeing if you can find anything. Yeah, finding carcasses. Finding, finding carcasses. That is the way that you give players the information they need to make the decisions about the content they want to engage with in a sandbox game. Yeah. You can't present a sandbox and not tell them what's in it somehow and then yeah. expect them to, expect that style to play well. It just doesn't work, you know. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, and also being specific with what they find. Like if you're like, all right, we think there's a dragon in the area. Let's start looking for signs. Mm-hmm. And if you're only finding like, you know, sheep. Wild dogs, yeah. wolves. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, we can handle this. But when you start finding like pieces of like cows and like bigger, bigger prey uh, animals, bigger rocks. like, yeah, yeah. yeah, a wing of a rock, like that's yeah. when your players might go, okay, wait a minute. Wait a minute. This yeah. thing is probably bigger. way yeah. too big. We're gonna, yeah, we're going to need a bigger party. Uh, we're going to need some bigger items. We're going to need a bigger boat. We're going to need a bigger boat. A lot of DMs either uh, hand wave this. Uh, or or just sort of, you know, make a roll. To me, that's skipping parts of the adventure, like all of these steps, talking to the NPCs, getting the information out of them, making your first forays into the wilderness to try to find where this thing is. These are situations where the player's input, even if it's just like, here's how I approach this, can influence further events down the line. Mm-hmm. And to abstract that to the point where the players don't have any input, I think is really sort of doing this a disservice because... Like, this is about finding and hunting a dragon, not yeah. just like roll initiative, we're going to fight one, but like, you've got to go out in the wilderness, find its tracks, find the places that it, 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 uh, it frequents and visits if they're you know, outside of its lair. Right. You know, is there some spore or something that, it, that you can find of it? Scales, a trail through of, of crushed debris through wilderness. You might try to provoke 
a confrontation with it out in the wild in order to do something to it that you can you know use to track it whether it's a i don't know <laughs> putting a a coin you're very familiar with somewhere on its <laughs> on, on its person a, to, on to locate person object, to locate object yeah. on it or it's the D&D version of a tracker yeah you know yeah. i mean that's that's all you want to do or just provoke it just like maybe you just want to test the waters like can we even like you know mm-hmm. get this guy? I don't can know. Can we get this thing? Yeah, and and figure out how what's its commitment to uh, you know to a mm-hmm. fight? Is it going to stick around and, and go to toe to toe for a while, or is it uh, you know more cautious and might make a few lazy passes or attacks, but put up a stiff resistance? Then it's going to back off. Mm-hmm. Then you know if you're going to really fight that thing, you've got to corner it somewhere. If, and that's the deal with the dragon, and part of why you're looking for its lair is like fighting a dragon out in the wild is a losing proposition, especially if it's open air. Like, just oh. don't do it. Right? I mean, <laughs> I mean, what, I mean, yeah, that's, that's, that's the problem with dragons. It's like, I always think as a DM, like, why am I not having this guy or whatever swoop in? Yeah. Like, pick one up and just fly up. Yeah, that, and that's drop. certainly one. Yeah, I tried and doing pick that one once. Up and drop. I tried doing that once and the dragon didn't quite make the dragon didn't make it to the ground at all because it was shot up and, and blasted out of the sky beforehand. So that's that's another one to show you dragons are going to use cloud cover in the sun to yeah. approach and guess what they all have stealth proficiency. Mm-hmm. So they're probably quiet as owls when they're flying. And oh, when, oh, right, when, you know? that, when you're going for the for swooping in for the attack, yeah, you're, you're ducking the wings. You're not flapping. You're just uh, it's a straight dive. Yeah. yeah, and in that sense, you uh, snatch and grab, get one of them, drag them away. It, it's mean. You might not survive, um, but if you want like a authentic, potentially terrifying dragon encounter, then try that out. Um, and you know the guidelines that I would follow are just you know you can't pick up anything its size or larger. Uh, or maybe it can, but it's you know it's, it's severely limited in its speed. Yeah, and if you want to be kind of more of a dick, but not as lethal, put a lake nearby, and the oh, dragon yeah. just picks them up and tosses them tosses in them the middle the of the lake. Yeah, it's gonna just take that heavily armored take fighter, that heavily armored fighter, <laughs> drop <laughs> them from eighty feet into the water. Oh, yeah, you don't take any damage. Yeah. Start making start, start making athletics yeah. checks. Yeah. Yeah. Still wearing that full plate. <laughs> Still wearing that full plate. <laughs> Trying to hang on to that double bladed axe. <laughs> Okay, well. Yeah, make con save. Did you yep. hold your breath? <laughs> um, so that's sort of like just a, a general tactical consideration. Maybe those, maybe tactics like that are well known and talking to dragon slayers, talking to people that have uh, survived or seen mm-hmm. it, assuming they're not thralls of the dragon and are out to get you. But locating its lair is, is a wilderness adventure. It involves perception and survival and looking at the lay of the land and, and sort of like finding where its lair is going to be, while at the same time avoiding detection by it. Because if you get closer to the lair, number one, you're going to start having to deal with lair effects and the oh, regional yeah. effects that come from those. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, but also, you run the risk of coming across its like well-traveled paths and its hunting grounds, and it might know you're there. And it that yeah. could be bad news. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? it might have some creatures that work for it. It could that very look well out for that, yeah. adventures that yeah. are coming up. That kind of like game of cat and mouse mm-hmm. of, yeah, you you have a challenge. You got to take down this big beast, but uh, you know, don't don't just let it know where you where you are. Yeah. Right? You know, uh, oh yeah. So, I mean, yeah. Well, when it, when it comes to a stakeout and surveillance, yeah, I mean stealth is key. Yeah. And so, but but that that could also uh, be a fun like tension in the party, especially yes. if there's like a barbarian because oh, yeah. like. You need to figure out the dragon's habits, right? Yes, you do need to figure it out, right? It's like hunting anything else, knowing where uh, it hunts, knowing where it travels to and from hunts, knowing what its daily routine is like, knowing uh, where it is at any given time, mostly because you know you, you want to make sure you can set adequate uh, traps for it and ambushes that it won't detect. So they need to be set up along like paths that it typically follows and if it's like flying way up high in the air you might just not be able to period but maybe it doesn't fly up that high and maybe it hunts in a variety of different ways you know blue and white dragons can burrow yeah. right like they might uh, travel exclusively through either snow or sand just to avoid any the possibility of anybody seeing them mm-hmm. and and black and green dragons have swim speeds if there's if there's adequate water supply nearby then oh, there yeah. that might be the preferred way of traveling just because it's not out in the open mm-hmm. and and so like thinking of those things thinking of like the alternate uh, uh speeds the, you know red dragons can climb you might be thinking to yourself why in the world can they climb if they can fly because they got to climb around places where they can't fly you know, how else do you think they get to the bottom of a dungeon? <laughs> they crawled down there. And you can surprise players with things like that. You can have a red dragon show up in places that otherwise wouldn't be, because even though it's a big beast, 
it can also like kind of squeeze itself into places that you can't other, you wouldn't otherwise expect it to be. And yeah, I mean, I've, I've always attributed kind of more of a feline grace to yeah, dragons yeah. and the fact that they can kind of slink around. Yeah, I kind of like the idea that given enough time, they can ooze themselves anywhere. You know, that it's not necessarily like, that they're not like... like a boneless dragon? Or yeah, yeah, like boneless <laughs> or cartilaginous dragon yeah. or something like that. But it's oh, like, God. yeah, even just a keyhole, it might take a while. But that dragon's going to just start with a claw and just, I'm coming for you. <laughs> I'll be there. I'll be there. <laughs> just ooze through. But maybe oh, it's got you cornered in a room, right? <laughs> like maybe you're, uh, you're trapped and it starts oozing, oozing in and around the door, you know, mm -hmm. and, and reforming itself with its uh, pliable bones uh, on the other side. And that's um, when you stone shape the door. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> gotcha, bitch. Gotcha. Getting back to sort of like locating the lair and finding it, it's a wilderness action. And and the DMG and D&D &D doesn't really provide any kind of rules for like how you find something in the wilderness. Like I ran into this uh, when I presented a challenge to one of my players a uh, group about a year ago where it's like, you've got to find someone who you believe to be dying in the wilderness. There's a limited time to get to them. It's a big wilderness, so locate creature eventually will help, but not immediately. Yep. And then it became a question of like, how in the world, other than just my whim, mm -hmm. does the party find something? And so you might need to come up with rules for that, guidelines. If you're using a hex, uh, hex conveniently breaks down into six different sections, which correspond to a D6 rather well. So just like randomly pick which of those uh, six sub, uh, you know, equilateral, equilateral triangles the, um, the layer is in. Um, and then have the party sort of search through that or just roll the D6, do they find it? Um, but you can start using things like that, using the survival rules, using the wilderness um, you know, procedures that are in the DMG, kind of create an experience where the party is having to navigate inhospitable terrain, find this place, stake it out, camp out for a month or two months in the middle of nowhere to observe the entrances to, the, to that lair. Are those the only entrances? Like maybe we gotta go in there when it's not there and scout the place out. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking like you, you've gone from a dragon as like a one-time encounter that swoops in on the party, does a bunch of ele you know, elemental damage, and then eventually ends up as scale armor and talons on necklaces. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> you can do that, and that's satisfying, but you can also make like a really a thing out of it, and they've got to like work for that dragon. Where is it? Can we find it? That's before you, they even consider, is it possible that we can kill this thing? Right. Yeah. Go to the stakeout, they've waited, they've observed the dragon's patterns, all that other good stuff. You might try to provoke a confrontation in the field just to get the measure of the dragon. Is yeah, it yeah. gonna, you know, is it gonna flee? Is it gonna stay and fight? Although that's a dangerous proposition. And then the lair assault itself is, I mean, I kind of think maybe we might have to do a show just over layers and attacking them. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> I got like five different ideas for that. Right. The but dwarven in, sinkhole idea is my favorite. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to hire a team of dwarves. Dwarven, dwarven sappers and engineers to help me get this treasure. We're going to go out. underneath. We'll distract them out here. They'll never know where They'll it never know. But in general, when you're, when you're considering your lair, um, and we have done shows on other monster layers, so maybe uh, check that one out. I'll give you some ideas uh, as well. But when you're designing and thinking about the lair, it's for defense. It's for mm -hmm. like protecting its, its hoard, protecting itself while it sleeps. Consider that it probably has multiple layers yeah, yeah. and that there's one layer where it keeps its stuff and that's a sort of home base. But you know, if it can fly, if it has a, a range of 48 miles, then maybe it has some sort of secluded lesser layers at the, at the edge of that radius. So if they need to travel further, they have a safe place to be. And maybe it's one of these false layers that the players first discover or first uh, you know, happen upon, and they think they've found the real lair and they stake it out. It's like, gosh, this dragon's not there a lot. You know? And so maybe you have an opportunity to like, visit one of the satellite layers and see some of the lesser guardians and, and get a sense for what, who or what this dragon is before tracking it back to the main lair and, and confronting it. Especially with like a red, you know, they go in the fake lair. That's when you finally find the tunnel that yeah. literally goes 50 miles that they crawl through the ground <laughs> right. to get to the real lair. Yeah. And yeah. they never re leave the real lair by any entrance or exit. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, they're never seen to come or go from the real lair. They always assumed that they're there. Smoke's always coming out of the mountain. Mm -hmm. And so there's deceptive things like that, you know, like maybe the minions of the dragon are there to, like, you know, keep up the deception. Light and, fires. And make yeah. It like <laughs> make it seem asleep. like the dragon's there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, even after it's long gone. The more we kind of talk through this, like, revisiting dragons, what we do, like, I, I got 
really excited. Like, I think you could have an awesome Dragon Slayer kind of mini campaign where it's just a bunch of, of, of tough, uh, you know, ruthless Dragon Slayers and the, the things that they have to do to, like, find these creatures and face them in battle. And, mm-hmm. and, and you know, and that, what I'm thinking now is, like, they might not even, like, face them in melee. If I'm a Dragon Slayer, I'm all ranged, you know. Give me one of those Ballista. Yeah, Ballista, <laughs> some way to tie it down, yeah. and bury it, smother it, you right. know. Like, Put yeah. it on the back of a hill giant. Uh-huh. <laughs> Find some way. You know, uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, more du- more dragons in dungeons, please. Yes, uh, I know it's some find it ridiculous, and I used to until I realized that it's a dragon in a dungeon, and that's kind of fun. It's an engaging fight. It's interesting. You can do stuff that's uh, uh, you know mm-hmm. different with it. But like you said, having them go through all of that, it's going to make that that dragon slayer sword or that armor or whatever, even if they just take a few teeth for for yeah. trophies. You know, I mean, I I always do that. But oh, sure, it would make it it. To me, like you're attaching a whole story, yeah, to that, yeah, and, and making and the players work it a, for it, yeah, some some legend and some myth to that, you know. Yeah. We had to slog through the mud for two months, yeah, and that was just the beginning. Yeah, the insects were terrible, you mm-hmm. know. Like we, we had to sit there in the mud and the dirt, <laughs> and the, you know, for like forty eight days, yeah, <laughs> till finally it came back <laughs> bloated with with meat. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's right. when we descended upon it. And that's when we descended upon it while it was sleeping its meal off. Yeah, you know, like that's the kind, and and maybe you know, maybe you want the I we charge in and it's the dragon knows we're there and it's like a Larry Elmore drawing right like someone's oh, yeah. on a, a, a horse and uh, there's flowing hair and uh, <laughs> you can have that fifth edition does that very well and you can the, the variety of ways that you can have a, a dragon but like thinking about them as creatures in your world that live there that have a presence that mm-hmm. that that are felt you know another scenario would be like what if two young adults trying to claim the same territory because it's like prime layer territory yeah. and their squabbles with each other their their constant uh, mm-hmm. fighting is just becoming a real mm-hmm. uh, a real threat burning each else. other's tribute villages yes you know, yeah they're stuff going like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. especially mm-hmm. if they're like siblings so they look alike Ooh, yeah. so now you're screwing with the village saying you didn't give me enough tribute well, uh, uh, um, you know? right. and then they revolt against their dragon yes. it's like whoa, Wait, what's whoa going on? I treat y'all well yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, and lastly for me, like uh, a great resource for just like tying dragons into the world and making them a part of your setting is uh, Ed Greenwood's series on the dragons of Faerun. There are a couple of places online where people have like posted or, or, or copied the, uh, the old dragon articles. And they're just fun to read because they give you a sense of like dragons as these larger than life creatures. They, almost every one of them I've read, there's nothing boring or usual about typical about these dragons. They're yeah. all either take the usual draconic characteristics and exaggerate them or like completely come up with something new to pre- how, you know a new way to present uh, a dragon and they're like one of my favorite things about the forgotten realms is 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 Ed's uh, integration and and drawing out like just the weird and fantastic parts of the setting um, and then just like having an exhaustive detail about it mm-hmm. <laughs> so oh, nice they're they're really good inspiration for your own dragons uh, in that sense Yeah. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Have you joined our huge giveaway yet? We're picking the winners on October 26th. Five ways to enter, link in the comments and description. WebDM exists thanks to our Patreon patrons, the Web Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. Check out our free podcast episodes right now, including our free interview with Luke Gygax about all things D&D. WebDM is a proud partner of D&D Beyond, our favorite supplement for our D&D games. We've got a link to them in the description. Go and check them out. If you like our advice for your games, then why don't you come check us out and watch us play? Yeah, we've got games on Twitch every week, and they're archived on our second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays. Thanks for watching. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh God. Oh, that's oh, so what are you doing? Oh, what the I've never felt this feeling I've never before. Felt this feeling oh either. my god. What is oh, what does blue and green make? It makes <laughs> yellow. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have some golden Let's showers. Have some, oh yeah. Don't, don't bring me into this. Don't bring me into this. I don't even know what cloak <laughs> is, but I'm I'm pretty sure that the director 
hates the word moist. The opening that my that I that my penis and my poop comes out of. <laughs> that seems like it's right for urinary tract infections. Fine, I'm, I don't have. We both have them. What are you well, worried I, about? Never, I live in the I live in the swamp, so it's all nasty yeah, all the oh time. So God. I guess I've never noticed. I, I live in the desert. And it's dry. That shit's gotta get dry. It does. Does it get too dry? I need it wet. <laughs> oh, just stay down, Lionheart. Stay down. Mm-hmm. Never. I, I bet the money on a tiller. I bet it on a tiller. Wrong bet. <laughs> Why are they biting oh. each other's mouths at the same time? Oh, an abomination! What the? <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> that might accidentally be an amazing thing. Ken! Nick! <laughs> Ken! Oh, you can't fly! I know, I fell. God damn these lack of wings. No. 